Welcome to the Level Up Your Band podcast, episode 34. And welcome back to the Level Up Your Band podcast. My name is Gavin Patterson. I'm here with Julian Pombo. How are you doing today? Hi. Yeah, I'm fine. You know, just the usual. You know, I've, I literally, I have no news. Um, uh, that, yeah, that's it. I have nothing. Great. How are you? <laughs> Good. No news at all. <laughs> um, yeah. It's what you want to hear. Um, well, yeah, no news know. is good news, eh? Yeah, that's true. That is true. I've been doing a lot more, a lot more work at the at my desk. So Rachel made me a nice, a hot pink uh, wrist, a uh, wrist rest. Ah, oh, for your keyboard. Yeah, for my keyboard and my mouse. Nice. Because I spent like, um, if you haven't checked it out, I have a I have a gaming channel with my friend, and the production value has gone up. Yeah. It, exponentially so we're releasing videos like six days six days a week now almost 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 daily except i need a break otherwise i'll go insane and my wrist needs a break that's why you Uh know clicking and moving stuff and making oh yeah good fun (laughs) though it is good fun yeah it's good fun check it out if you like gaming um who doesn't like gaming yeah at yeah at the moment we're playing uh, we're finishing up uh, uh, a, a dating sim, uh, which is fun, and we're gonna be st- and we're gonna be starting another one. <laughs> uh, so that yeah, if if you're into that kind of stuff, check it out. And we also play normal games there too, you know. So just oh, what you what you make of the the news this morning? The, uh, Bethesda has been purchased by Microsoft. Zenimax. Um. Don't I don't know how I feel about that, man. Yeah. As long as well, I mean, I, and now because I'm, I'm I'm a member of the of the of the PC uh, master race, as I call it, um, I'm not I'm not too bothered because, uh, you know, I, before when when I was on my Wii PlayStation, I would get worried if somebody Microsoft bought like an IP. Yeah. And then it's just like, exclusive yeah, we're gonna make Xbox. it Xbox exclusive, you yeah. know, uh, but now. You don't All care. the IPs are open to me. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's yeah, good attitude to have. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, um, yeah, ho- I don't know. We'll see what happens with it. Yeah, we're not we're not uh, the gaming podcast, so we'll we'll, we'll crack no, on with no. this because all all the people we'll crack on with the actual music stuff are bored. Yeah, yeah I've already left. So <laughs> today's episode. This is a su- subject that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we've talked about it in dribs and drabs through the yeah through the podcast is the topic of monitoring mm. um it's it's actually quite a big topic yeah, we should have dealt with it earlier because it's really important it's yeah it's, it is it's insane yeah. how important it is it's probably the most important so mm. well, it's, it's often overlooked because you're always obse- obsessed with all the other bits and pieces of like playing and recording, yeah. um, but uh-huh. I would say that the most important aspect of playing music is the ability to hear yourself and to hear the mu- yeah. musicians around and, and you. other people as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, performances are constantly being ruined by poor monitoring. Um, how many times have you seen a singer on stage, you know, with one ear? out and like like this like can't hear can't hear and constantly like moaning that they're they can't hear themselves and it's so common Mm -hmm. or singing out of tune because they can't hear themselves they can't hear the band yeah although although to be fair maybe this is maybe this is a a bit mean quite a lot of the time when i've when when i've worked for the singer that does that a lot is generally because you know they're not very good and they're just trying to blow on something fired um, <laughs> um, but no, it does happen. It does happen. I've definitely, um, as yeah, monitoring is is very important. It's very important. You need to make sure you have like a clear picture of what's of what's going on. Yeah, you know. So 
it's always, like I said, it's always pushed to one side. People mm. just sort of, they don't think about it. So you're, you're going to a venue, you're not going to the venue thinking, hmm, I wonder how I'm going to hear myself tonight. You, you, it's not something that cr crosses a lot of people's minds. It's just kind of like, oh yeah, there'll be monitors there and things will happen. We'll have a sound check and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But the most gigs fall apart uh, or the gigs that do fall apart, most of the time it's because the band can't hear themselves. And 90% yeah. uh, of the time it's because the guitars and the drums are too loud. Um, so um, we can talk about the different types of monitoring yeah. you can think about. And you can get your own systems as well um, to take two venues yeah, so that you have a that. consistent system from venue to venue. Um, there's a couple of bands I've been in and am in currently that we have solutions. We have come up with solutions for overcoming this monitoring problem um and now like mm. we were like skeptics for so long and now that we've converted to these systems we are like what took us so long this is <laughs> crazy like it's so good i can't believe we put it off for so long so we'll go through the different types of monitoring and i'll start yeah. with the most obvious one well the least obvious but the most sort of um um practical one uh, if you're playing non-electric instruments, this probably mm -hmm. applies to you more, is a physical position. So what that basically means is physically positioning yourself close to the instruments you want to hear. So if you play in like a, a little acoustic band, so there's like a keyboard, vocals, acoustic guitar, yeah. and you're maybe not fully mic'd up, maybe the keyboard's got an amp, your acoustics just going out um, with no mic and you've maybe mm. got a vocal mic or something. It's very intimate. It's a kind of lounge, you know, kind of setting, quiet thing. If you want to hear something, you can't turn it up. You just have to go closer <laughs> um, or play less. Um, that's that's something my um, one of my teachers always ta taught me in high school um, when playing with acoustic mm. instruments. If you can't hear the soloist, shut up. <laughs> because mm. you're playing too bring loud, it down. bring it down. If you can't, if you can't hear the main thing, it, chances are you're too loud. Now that doesn't go for me personally as a drummer, because my my drum kit will always sound louder to me, no matter how quiet I play. Um, just because drums are loud. But if you're third saxophone and you can't hear lead saxophone, and he's sitting two two seats next to you, you're playing too you're loud. Probably, you're probably yeah, you're stop probably, honking away. Yeah, yeah. So this, I'll give you an example of electric instruments that have actually used this technique. Back in the 1950s, um, mm -hmm. so, so in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, um, recording music became more popular. Um, mm -hmm. They used to record to wax discs. It was, really yeah. it was really terrible. If you listen to like big band music from the 40s, um, yeah, it's dreadful. It's dreadful. And cylinders as well, eh? Yes, wax cylinders. Yeah, um, really, really terrible sound. Um, and it was all they had, and it was usually one, one or two microphones set around the room. And this continued on into the fifties, and little studios were opening up, sort of independent studios, and bands could go in, playing like skiffle music and sort of early rock and roll. And the way they would record is. They would set up one microphone, usually a large diaphragm figure of eight microphone. Figure of eight is mm -hmm. um, the microphone uh, has a double-sided capsule, so the microphone picks up things in front and behind but not to the sides, which meant that you could place the singer on one side of the microphone as close as I am to my microphone right now and the rest of the band on the other side of the microphone s dotted around the room. And the way that you would alter the volume of each instrument is by placing them further or closer to the microphone. Mm. Um, and you could achieve some pretty decent results from this um, compared to the old 1940 recording because uh, new ways of recording were coming in um, things like uh, shellac and eventually tape, magnetic tape. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know, um, magnetic tape recording 
um, was it was start starting out and no one was buying into it because I don't know maybe just fear or whatever they had kitted out these big studios to do this wax stuff or shellac or whatever and maybe they didn't want to spend the money but it was actually Bing Crosby who put his sort of money his sort of wealth into that technology to popularize it and he used the magnetic tape recorders and of course his recordings would as a result sound better than anyone else's and everyone wanted that and it popularized multi-track tape recording which is what we know today all the way up to the 90s the 80s and 90s um when it was kind of phased out i mean people still record to tape to this day so it's kind of rare now but um the whole mm. the whole um I mean, if you if you compare the sound of tape to the sound of the old wax stuff, it's like night and day. Um, tape is extremely good sounding. It's, it's very, very um, accurate. Um, but it adds a little bit of colour. It's a really nice sort of warm, yeah. saturated sound. Um, so that that was popularised. So yeah. in, the first, in the first instance of uh, recording in a room with one microphone... Like I said, you get right up close to the mic if you're a singer and you put the drums at the back because they're going to be the loudest. So you want to get them up the back, out the road, so that it's going to be quieter. You get the guitar amps up a level and the bass up a level and the engineer would listen in the, in the control room and go, hmm, I need more guitar. You would turn the amp up or move it closer to the mic. Drums are too loud, so they would get some baffles, some... Uh, Mm. felt walls and stuff and set it up so that it would dampen the sound of the drums and then they would put a, a slap delay effect on you got this in all like the early, early um, Elvis records you know that sort of slap um, what they do is mm. they delay the I think they run it through two machines or something and, and offset it by a spe specific uh, time so you get that sort of John Lennon slap kind of delay thing so that was the style. Um, that was the only way you could do it. So that's right. and going to that that whole spatial thing with with playing, that is like one of the most important parts of playing in a jazz group, as you'll explain. Um, knowing where to place your bass, you're you're probably going to place your bass next to the drums, right? Oh yeah, yeah. 90 so it tends thing. to be, uh huh. It, it yeah. So drums, bass, guitar all your rhythm section are going to be pretty close to each other right you know uh, in a in a in uh, in a big band yep um uh, for anyway from from what i remember uh, from the before times anyway um yeah. you know <laughs> but yeah that's that's generally how 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 it would work you know obviously i don't know what they would have done back in the day when it was it was all Acoustic, no amps, that kind of a thing, would have been totally different. But um, you look at the pictures and the videos of all the old stuff, you tend to see yeah. the rhythm section were quite quite close together. Mm. Um, bass, the bass, it's not the the upright bass would usually be like hovering right over the drum kit, you know, just right next to the guy. Yeah, um, more or less. You want to hear that bass? Um, yeah, uh, and and the drummer will the yeah the the bass player wants to be able to hear wants to be able to hear that right symbol you know and then your your drummer actually wants to lock in with the with the bass as well you know yep um it's it's funny i, I play in a big band occasionally um and we went through a venue change maybe about six years ago or something mm -hmm. and the way the place was laid out uh we couldn't get the rhythm section all together and we're all kind of spread out and I didn't oh. <laughs> realise how much I hated it until we moved to, or we, we rearranged. So I spoke to the band leader and I was like, the way it was set up, the drums were at the back, again, because the drums are loud, they want the, as far away from the audience as possible so that by the time the sound yeah. gets out the front, it's all balanced. So the bassist was in front of me. He had his amp set up at, in front of my bass drum, pointing out, so I couldn't hear the bass. So... Mm. At the next, the next time I did it, I asked the band leader if possible, if I could go in front of the bass guitar. That way he can always hear me anyway. He can hear me and I can now hear his bass. And the difference was 
unbelievable. It is like having mm-hmm. uh, working with earmuffs and then just pulling the earmuffs off and be like, oh, I can hear. Yeah, it's so good. Um, it's the same with um, the guitar and the, the keyboards um, locking in together because if, if they're both like chordal instruments and they can't hear each other in a big band, it's mm-hmm. a disaster waiting to happen. Um, because yeah. you know you don't know what which one's doing what. You've got one playing slash chords, one not, and then they all clash and they don't know because they can't hear each other. So get your get your rhythm section like glued together. That's if you're playing that style of music. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I used to play in a, an orchestra, it used to be the same thing. Um, you mm. s- you set the the drum kit behind the brass. I would always prefer that yeah. because the the tubas and the euphoniums would be playing the the bass. I wanted to get myself next to the bass so they could yeah. hear where the, the downbeats are and because you want to lock in your downbeats with the, the bass and if you're over the other mm. side of the room there's going to be a delay or you can't hear them properly. You want to catch what they're playing mm. with your right foot. Um, so yeah. I would always set my, myself right next to the timpani yeah. um, behind the... It's to- mm. totally irrelevant to <laughs> modern music but it's just... It kind of it yeah. all well, translates. I mean, unless... Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like, this is really important if you're playing any kind of acoustic music. Yeah. People don't actually realize how important it is, yeah. you know, um, you know, positioning yourself in such a way that you can hear everything, Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. So we'll move on to the, the sort of meat of this episode. Um, stage monitors. So that's the right. second type of monitoring or listening to instruments. So you turn up to a venue and they've got these dirty big speakers on the floor <laughs> that fire um, basically jet engine noise sound at you. Um, I remember the first time I went to uh, just a pub live gig thing when I was like 17 yeah. or 18 and just I was baffled how loud everything is. Um, it <laughs> baffles me to this yeah. day. It's so loud. Yeah, I, I honestly, I don't get it. Like, because uh, I've played a lot of venues like that, where because you can't hear anything. Sometimes, like, like the only way you'll be able to actually hear what's going on is if you bring, like, earplugs with you. Yeah, yeah. You need to, you know, like, that's so lame going to see like a rock band and having to wear earplugs. Yeah. It's I just, know. Ugh, I know, sucks. I, but um, and it, it, yeah, and he, the thing is, is that because it's so loud, you actually can't hear any detail whatsoever. It's just, yeah, you know, it's just noise. It's just white noise. Yep, it sucks. Yeah, I've been to a few loud gigs, like metal gigs. It's yeah. probably the loudest out there. It's just like the whole place is rattling. Um, to the point where the actual venue walls are vibrating, you can hear like the roof and the ceiling, and like everything's just shaking. It's not. I mean, it's a it's a cool feeling and all that, but you can't, like you said, you can't hear any clarity. Like there's there's some there, mm. there was a band I went to see. There was a, like a support band on, and it was the loudest thing I've ever heard. Um, and they had a little sort of acoustic-y song. And it was like a minute and a half into the song before I could actually hear the acoustic guitar. Um, it was just so bassy. There was a bass guitar, bass guitarist mm-hmm. there, and it was just boom, boom. And then there's this like twinkly thing on the top. I couldn't quite make it out. And I was like, oh, it's an acoustic because I couldn't <laughs> see. I was like, what is that? What is that? Is it a keyboard or something? No, it's a, it's a yeah. guitar. Like, it, it's just too loud. So, when you're on stage, and I've had two, two um, um, sort of viewpoints, because I've played in big stages, playing drums and playing keyboards, and let me tell you, they're totally different experiences. Mm. It's weird um, when you're playing drums and you've got a drum a drum monitor next to you firing stuff at you. Uh, that's a much less pleasant experience than playing keyboard because the keyboard itself makes no noise uh, acoustically. So the only thing you can hear really, if it's a big stage, is the stuff coming out the amp, out the monitor. 
So it's much more pleasant playing keyboard um, at one of those big loud gigs because um, you're far enough away from everyone else that you you can the, the loudest thing next to you is your monitor, which is quite nice because you can get a much more balanced mix. But as a drummer, mm. you're constantly battling with the acoustic sound of the kit, which is right in front of your face. And then you've got this yeah. thing. It's always in your left side as well, which really irritates me because you end up becoming deaf in your left ear. Um, so you've got the, the right symbol on the right hand side and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> and usually a guitarist or something. And then everything you're getting for the rest of the band is coming from your left. Um, yeah. Oh, so annoying. So when it's keyboard, you can get it in front of the keyboard. So you're pl playing your keys and you have the monitor down in front of you. So it's firing up at you and you get it in equal ears. So it's a much nicer thing. But um, I'm sure it's the same for bass. Uh, your monitor will probably be in front of you 90% of the yeah, time. Yeah, it's usually the case, yeah. So... Even then, I, so I I play through an amp, and my amp acts as my that's monitor. Right. So I hardly right, ever yeah. I hardly ever ask for 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 bass yeah. in my monitor because I can hear the bass anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's always like the other little things, keyboard, you know, um, you know the any acoustic instruments I'm playing with that kind of a thing, vocals. Yeah, vocals is kind of if I'm if I'm playing with a band that needs that you know or it has that and i want to listen to that yeah same um i always want um bass and vocals more than anything else mm. uh, i don't really i don't really care that much about ha having guitar i mean if, if i can get a tiny bit of a guitar i'll be like yeah okay because there's always like the guitars are always dead loud on stage anyway so i just mm. i just want to get the important bits no offense guitarists <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> this podcast sucks one out of ten um yeah so that comes on to the 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 singing part which is kind of the the that is the most important part if you've got a vocalist the vo the vocal line is the most important part of your band um if you're mm. playing just sort of pop rock music whatever um yeah so you want your your vocalist to be comfortable and for them to hear themselves and if they're standing, usually on a stage, usually in front of a drum kit, usually two guitars behind them with their amps up to 10 and a bassist, <laughs> and they've got three monitors, you know, one to the left for the guitarist, one to in front of them for them, and then one to the right for the bassist, all blaring this noise up at them. So they're sitting there with their mic. It's squealing because, oh, I can't hear myself, I can't hear myself. And guess what? When you turn up the vocal mic, it turns up everything in the room because everything in the room is bleeding into that microphone, which is then in turn getting turned up in your monitor. And yeah, if you're a soft, a soft singer, it doesn't matter how much you'll turn that mic up, you'll never get it louder, which yeah. what happens, the singer pushes and ends up shouting and ends up hurting their voice. I, I just... It's, it's a horrible, vicious yeah. cycle to get into. Um, so, how do we how do we overcome this? Yeah. We have a solution. <laughs> so, the, yeah. the third type of monitoring: in yeah. ear take monitoring. Those stage monitors. Yeah, yeah take those stage <laughs> monitors and tape them to your head. It's yeah. <laughs> basically what it's basically what it is. Yeah, <laughs> just just imagine too, like. I don't know, Packer Bell PC speakers with gaffer tape around your head. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, any of your monitors. Um, so, Ugh. around. A very elegant it's, solution. It's a very, it's a great solution. Um, yeah. If you've got, if everyone in your band is on any of your monitors, you can get rid of all of the stage monitors. And mm -hmm. what happens? The sound becomes cleaner. All the microphones that are on stage are picking up what they need to pick up and they're not picking up any bleeding instruments like um, massive big cabs spewing out just feedback, distorted rubbish. So the only thing that should be acoustic on stage is the drum kit and maybe some guitar amps. But even that can be digital. You don't even need that, especially if you're um, mm. in ears. There's no reason to have a cab. Um, you can have your cab if you're if you're a touring band and you're doing things properly. Um, you can have your cab set um, at the side of the stage, literally. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's a lot of bands do that. 
And um, mm. what they do is they they um, like like some, like really big bands, like your I don't know, name a big band. Um, any big band, just Queen. I don't know. Oh, somebody any, like that. Oh, as in like a jazz big band, not no, a no, no, big, a famous band, <laughs> a famous band, just any fa- Dream like theater, famous or um, anyone, <laughs> just I don't know, Billy Joel, ZZ Top, some, Kiss. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, know. yeah, someone like that, right? Um, a lot of them will have. Um, well, in the case of Dream Theater, we were saying there they have fake cabs on the stage. It's just a prop. Oh right, okay. It's just a big uh, plywood. Oh, it's just so fake it, it's cab. Just so it looks cool. So it looks cool. Um, all the yeah. all the heads are at the side of the stage. Um, I don't think I don't even think they they do um, cabs. I think it's all emulations. But some bands have cabs oh, right, okay. sitting at the side of the stage mm-hmm. in the wings blaring away and they have microphones in front of the cabs at the side of the stage so that the stage noise is kept quiet and then the sound of the cabs on the side of the stage mm-hmm. goes into the he- headphones um, but if you're just starting out and you can't really do that so what I would recommend is if you can go digital I would recommend doing it so what you what you can do is mm-hmm. have your head have your guitar head but no, no cab so you can run it through i think you can get pedals that do this that just have cab emulations so you can fire them out to front of house and you're in your monitors you don't have to carry around a cab which is great and there's no on stage noise so if you hook up everyone to any of your monitors and the only thing that's blaring on stage is drums then you can get much better control of your mix and thus you can have a better sound over, overall um, for the crowd and for yourself, and it's much more happy. It was a, around, um, I don't know when you started using them, but I think it was about 2014 I got my first set of in ears, and I've still got them. They're actually right here. Mm. Um, these are so, for, for the YouTube people. These are just um, nice and nice and simple, cheap. Um, any of your monitors I've been using since 2014. These are the Shure 215s. Um, they come mm. with um, three sets of foam uh, earpieces and three sets of uh, hollow plastic ones. I prefer the foam ones. Um, they mm. I have done nothing to them since I got them. Um, All right. They have never broken yet. Um, they're great. I love them. I've I've used them for Aye. literally hundreds of gigs now, and yeah. they're solid. I think they were like ninety pounds, yeah. eighty I've, pounds. Yeah, I mean, I've I've used all sorts of different, all sorts of different things. You can get, it's not ideal, but I've I've used headphones, and earphones. You know, like like these. I've used ge- these in like shows and gigs, and it's been absolutely uh-huh. fine. Not giving me any problem. Obviously, not not. On stage is a different idea. You look like a bit of a doofus yeah. if you're sitting there with <laughs> with these on, yeah. you know, because they're not um, they're not discreet whatsoever. No, but um, for the likes of like playing in a pit band, yeah, they're perfect. Yeah, these are great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're absolutely fine. Yeah, I've played know? I've played um, with my my M fifties in a pit band, just fine. Yeah, they're because mm-hmm. you're not bashing your head around and stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe maybe you are if you're doing like. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Depends uh, on the show. Yeah. So um, this this particular model is just it's just like a standard. If you're looking on YouTube, it's just a standard headphone jack, um, just a mm-hmm. mini jack. You can get like a jack adapter on Tolman or something. Um, and the only thing you need to figure out is how to deliver sound to them. So that that's yeah. the thing. That's the big thing that really got me. Um, I'm like, how am I going to get? my specific mix in my head uh, the way I want it that's the tricky part um, if you're for example if you run a a wedding band for example and you do all your own sound because all wedding bands do all their own sounds you can you can you can do it um, for example we we use uh, the Behringer X Air system what it is right. is a, it's a a little box 
with uh, 16 or 18, 18 inputs and it's got six uh, auxiliary outputs. Mm. So that means we can have six individual monitor mixes. So we can have six people on headphones. I mean, or stage monitors. We can mix and match. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. But nice. to get that to the headphones, you need to have amplification, just like a guitar amp. Um, because mm -hmm. you can't just plug your headphones into the the mixing desk and expect it to be ready. You need to actually amplify the signal. I didn't know that for the longest time. Um, when I was building the, the recording studio, I got all my uh, equipment, my mixing desk and all that, and I was like, okay, I'm good to go. I just need to plug in my headphones into the auxiliary channels and then I plug it in and I can't hear anything. It's weird. Turning the volume up full and I can just barely hear something and it's just mm. hiss. Sss. I'm like, what's going on? Why is, why is it doing this? And then I'm like, oh, you need headphone amplifiers. That's a thing. Okay. <laughs> so um, even your phone has a headphone amplifier inside it. Uh, not, not many folks know that you actually need to do mm. that because a headphone is just basically a tiny, tiny, tiny little speaker, little driver inside the capsule, just like a guitar yep. cab or a computer speaker. So mm -hmm. um, what we did, um, I don't know what you guys do, but we take the, the um, lines out of the mixer and fire each individual line into a headphone amp. And we have like a rack headphone amp and we can plug in yeah. all the headphones into this and it's got an individual amplifier for each auxiliary. So what that what does that mean? Yeah. Because it's a an uh it's the Behringer X Air, you can connect your iPad up to it and control your headphone mix from an iPad. So on stage you want more guitar, just go to your iPad, turn up the guitar or turn up the vocals, or turn up the reverb if you want, or just turn it off altogether, and you can control your own mix. Now that's if you've got your own sound package. What do you guys yeah. use? Do you use a Behringer? Um, uh, well, for a, for a while we used stage monitors. We didn't actually get a chance to use our... I don't remember what it is we use. I think it's probably... A, a, it's a similar system. Maybe the Midas. I think it's actually the same. It's, I think it's the exact same system that uh, you're that you guys use yep um because um gilbert our keys our keys player is really into tech and and all that so he was nerding out about it but yeah um i think that's what we're planning on using mm -hmm. um but yeah unfortunately i don't know when we'll get to use it but hopefully soon <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's the that's the plan um the yeah. the the thing about it though is which I was baffled um, mm. how affordable this option is because in the past, if you wanted iPad control, individual monitor mixes, you know, all of that, you're talking upwards a thousand pounds. Yeah. Easy. Um, for, it's, it's went up in price now, mind you, uh, of mm. just looking at it just now, we've got the Behringer XR18, I think it's called, XAR18. Um, when we got it, I think it was about three hundred and fifty pounds. It's now went up to four hundred, probably because no one's buying them, um, because everyone's in lockdown. Mm. But <laughs> we'll yeah. come back down again. Yeah, that's the that's the exact same one that we have. Ah, good. I think I don't even think it's the. I'm not even sure if it's the eighteen. I think we might have the slightly smaller one, the sixteen, because okay. we don't need that many. We yeah. don't need that many channels. Yeah, because it, we it's not a very big band that we're in, so. We use, we use, I think, I think we're, I've got the iPad there, but it's recording Zoom. Uh, we use, I think, maybe 16 channels, maybe 15 or 16, mm. and we always leave some spare because quite often, more often than not, you'll get someone in the in the crowd going, oh, I brought my acoustic with me, I'm just going to sing a couple of songs for my dad, he's in the crowd, blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. we've got, we've got some spare channels. It, it would suck yeah. if we didn't have that as backup mm. um so that's why we went for the big one but i mean it's so cheap and it works so well if you're if you're a kind of type of band that 
wants to be self-sufficient and wants to own their own equipment and and not be restricted by the equipment that's at the venue, I recommend it, um, even for doing uh, headphone mixes. And mm. if you're if you're not in the market for this sort of stuff, there's also an option for you guys as well. And you and if you want to do your your headphone mixes, um, what I've suggested to folks in the past who have asked about it is when you turn up at a venue and there's a sound guy and you're sound checking mm-hmm. and he's like, oh, what do you want in your monitors? Well, you can still have your sound engineer manage your headphone mix because he, when he turns a knob on his mixing desk and turns up the guitar for your stage monitor, what you can do instead mm-hmm. is turn it up for your in-ear monitors. All you need to do is tell him in advance, we're going to bring our in-ear system. So he'll mm-hmm. unplug all of the stage monitors and reroute them into your headphone box. Yeah. So what you can do is you can buy a headphone amplifier, um, which, well, depending on how many people in your band, you can get, I'm just looking up just now, I think the, the is it the H, yeah, the HA8000, which is, I think, the new one. They, they recently um, stopped making my favourite one, the one I have, which is the... It's the one before this. I can't remember the the code, but it was like one of the most popular headphone amps on earth. Um, but this one, this one they've replaced it with has more inputs. I think mine has four. This one has eight. Um, let's see how much this this guy has. Um, Behringer stuff is good. If it, like it gets a bad name because they're like, oh, Behringer is kind of cheap. But I tell you what, it's <laughs> I don't know. It's never uh, failed me. Yeah, well, here's the here's the thing. Apparently, the 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 quality is sh- shot up because they've been bought by TC Electronic, right? And they work so, with Midas as well. They're a great company. Okay, yeah, here we go. Um, the Behringer HA eight thousand V two is one hundred and twelve euros on Toman, so it'll be kind of roughly the same price in dollars and yeah. pounds. Um, and this has eight inputs, meaning that you can have eight individual headphone mixes so if you turn up to a gig get yourself one of these guys get a rack box you know like an armored hard case rack box fire that in it with all your leads and stuff you turn up at the gig and you're like okay we need them um, we've got six people in the band we've all got our own in your monitors um the guy will the, the sound guy will then plug instead of plugging into the stage monitors, we'll plug into your Behringer headphone amp and then out mm-hmm. the back of the machine will go to each individual person's headphones. So you, the drummer can be channel mm-hmm. one, the basses can be channel two, yeah. the guitarist channel three, blah, 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 blah. And then the next thing you have to figure out is mm. how, how you actually get your mix to yourself from the box. So the box is probably sitting at the side of the stage, right? The guy's plugged in, everything's all good. Now... In my case, I have my headphone amp sitting, and in, in the gigs I do, I have it sitting less than two feet away from my head, which means I don't even need yeah. an extension cable. I literally plug my headphones directly into the box right next to me, yeah. and it's fine. However, the singers in our band are miles away from the box, um, so they, they walk around in the crowd, and they still need their mm-hmm. headphone mix, so they bought a radio pack. So what what happens is the output of the headphone amp goes into a a transmitter, which transmits the signal through the air into a wee battery pack that sits on your belt, and then you plug your headphones into the wee battery pack, and you're good to go. They also have a wireless mic, so they're completely wireless. They can sing in the crowd and jump about and have full in your custom headphone mix and a wireless mic and just jump about and mm. if you're willing to spend the dosh it's a it's a worthy investment um yeah because you can move around you're not tied down by cables um yeah i know guitarists kind of there's a couple of guitarists do the same with their system they they go wireless it's something i know nothing about 
Yeah, I've I've always, it's always it's always tempted me to be honest. Um, yeah. you know, to just get a wireless system because you ever played one? Are an absolute no. I've seen I've seen plenty of people use them. Um, and I think I think it's just because the technology is um more accessible it's 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 more affordable than people think it is yeah you can get like a pretty decent um uh what you call it a pretty decent system for like 100 pounds something like that Uh uh-huh um and the latency is like next to nothing yeah you know um so it's definitely it's definitely an idea um yeah not much point if you're playing shoegaze and you're basically going to be at your pedal board all the time anyway. Yeah, there's no point. But it, it, in that case, there's probably not much point. <laughs> there's not even any point in getting a really big long cable. But um, if you're sticking with the one sound for most of the gig, you may be changing one or two times. Mm-hmm. I would, yeah. Consider to be it. honest, I've been really tempted to go for it. I don't know, but yeah, for for bass anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah, be a big, big step up. One less. Th- the only thing you need to worry about is just making sure it's charged up. Yeah, batteries. Yeah. 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 Batteries. Because a lot of them, a lot of them come with lithium batteries now, so um, you can charge them up. You know, just from BM uh, micro USB actually. <laughs> nice. That's cool. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool. But yeah, you just need to make sure that um, you charge them up. Yeah. Before you gig, otherwise, otherwise, it's just it's gonna yeah. die mid gig. I think a lot of people are put off of wireless systems when they watch Spinal Tap. You know the <laughs> scene where they're playing in the aircraft hangar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's not like that. It can be it's hit or like, miss. Not, but, yeah. Especially if you it's if you buy really like if that. you buy a cheap system, you're opening yourself up to potential problems. So you need to shop around and get the yeah the sort of the best one. Um, again, we are definitely doing research on stuff like this, and we're we're constantly updating the gear list on the website uh, for our sort of recommendations and the headphone stuff. I'm going to be uh, putting that up um, mm. hopefully before this goes out. Um, so yeah, um, the the whole headphone amp thing. If you're thinking, oh, it's an awful lot of money. See if there's four people in your band or five people in your band, and it's 112 euros split five ways. Do it, just do it, do it. It's like nothing. It's like 20 quid each or something, and you can get a headphone amp. Now the expensive part, of course, is you need to get the actual headphones <laughs> per member. Yeah. Now, there are cheap alternatives that are actually really good. Um, there, was a, there was a pair of headphones. I can't remember the name of them. There was a friend of mine got them, um, was recommended them, and I think they were like £15. And they're actually really yeah. good. They block out quite a lot, and they sound okay. Mm. Um, these, ones, these ones were, I think they were 85 when I got them. Um, yeah. They've lasted really well. They, they have hardly uh-huh. aged, considering the amount of gigs I've done. Um, mm single driver they sound as good as i'd ever want them i even do gardening with them so like <laughs> <laughs> like i'm out cutting my lawn and there's like <laughs> heavy like lawnmower i've got these in i can't hear anything and i can just hear a nice yeah. sweet softly spoken audiobook while i'm like proper <laughs> in the garden <laughs> and they're, they're, they just block it all out it's great um so another upside to having any your monitors as you will know yeah. If you're playing 50 gigs a year or 60 gigs a year, as mm-hmm. I was before lockdown, uh, <laughs> um, the, yes. if you're doing that, that many gigs or more on stage monitors, bye bye hearing. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be able to hear my grandkids. Um, so yeah. I decided quite early on to get in ear monitors. That way, it blocks out all of the rubbish that's happening on stage. And I can mm-hmm. just listen to a nice, quiet, really intimate, well customized mix in my head, nice and softly, for a nice four hour gig. Um, yeah. And I tell you what, see, sometimes you forget you're wearing them. You can be halfway through a gig 
and you go, oh, it's sounding really good tonight. Such a good sound. These headphones are great. Hmm, I wonder what it sounds like if I pull them out. Ha <laughs> ha, this will be a laugh. And then you just, you go to pull them out just to see what it sounds like on stage. And it's just like, lovely little, you know, intimate mix. Yeah, you pull yeah, them out yeah. and it's like, Rah! it's so, <laughs> it's the loudest. It's like, it's like lions and jam jars. like, nope. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Yeah. And I'm like, back in, I'm like, oh, the best money I've ever spent. Imagine listening to that. <laughs> just screaming noise yeah. for four hours straight yeah. every night or whatever. <laughs> I, I, it's like I don't regret buying them at all honestly money mm. well spent um, and I don't have tinnitus I don't have hearing loss it's great just yep. it's a great thing to consider um, I love mm -hmm. them to bits so you can get cheap alternatives that still block out lots of noise and yep. sound decent and will do the job and you can get your headphone amp for 100 quid split between the band you can get some wireless packs um, that are quite expensive, um, but if you don't want to go for that, yeah. get some heavy-duty extension cables. You can get a 10-meter hard armored cable to yeah. go from the headphone amp to your the, headphones. There's another solution, which I, I, I did remember. I mm -hmm. just remembered there. You can get these um, almost like belt packs, which basically you can connect an XLR cable all the way yeah. to the desk. Yeah. And the, and you can just clip it onto your belt or wherever, and then just plug your earphones, and you have a nice just a volume yes. control. And yes, that's yes, it. yes, yes. That's 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 another option, and that that's like twenty pounds. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, that's uh, the only downside great. is you're you're connected to uh, a big long cable. <laughs> yeah. So you just need to make sure that you you know either disconnect somehow yeah you know that's it's just cape yeah that's the that's the one big downside yeah loads of cables yes the, the, down, the downside to this this way of doing things is it is it is more complicated than the old-fashioned mm. stage monitors but sometimes you've got to sacrifice a little bit of simplicity yeah. in order to save your hearing for for better quality of life, basically. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it was simpler back in the day where I just turned up at a gig with my drum kit and just played and just just whatever sound was there was there. But I'm happier now because I've got a better mix in my head. I'm not going deaf. I enjoy the gig more. Mm. I get more life out of it. It doesn't fatigue me. Um, but it is a much more complicated system to set up and manage. But when you get into the habit of it, it's definitely so much superior um i would never go back now whenever i do mm. have to go back say maybe the system goes down or something and i have to play open ear oh it's such a miserable experience depending on the band of course um <laughs> if i'm playing with the big band i play open ear i don't play with any ears at all if i'm playing with the wedding band i'm yeah. i'm in eared up uh, eriska i play mm. sometimes both some gigs yeah. i'll do any or some day some gigs i don't just because just the nature of the band, everything like sometimes we can play like uh, little intimate places. Sometimes it's like bigger. Um, sometimes the stage yep. monitoring is actually really good. Sometimes it's really bad. Yep. It just depends. Um, it's not a super <coughs> loud band, is the thing. No, no, it's not. I mean, sometimes we don't even make the kit up because the other instruments are too quiet. So we just keep it keep yep. it chill. So mm -hmm. for those of you who have loads of money. Um, and want to want to do it properly and get like the the big the big boy the big boy headphones. Yeah. What you can do if you live in uh, the British Isles, you can sign up to become a member of the Musicians Union, the MU. And what mm. you can do, part of their package, you can go and get yourself a specialist hearing assessment. So, what you do is you make an appointment. And you go to some clinic somewhere, not in COVID, because it's currently shut, like everything else. Yeah. Um, and you can get a free um, audiological assessment mm. and ear checkup from a specialist in a clinic, worth up to £145. Mm -hmm. So this, this procedure would usually cost you £145. You're getting it for free. And mm. you can also get one set of free custom-made specialist musician's earplugs worth £170. <clears throat> so what they do is they pour hot wax in your ear. It sets. Lovely. And then they pluck it out. And then from that mould, 
they make you custom made earplugs for listening to music in loud spaces you want to have instead of having those cheap little foam ones you can have like proper custom made ones yep. and for I think 40 pounds maybe mm-hmm. uh, I can't see where it is I've got the page up here I can't remember it was for a, a really subsidised cost you can get uh, the same custom mould they can make a second mould as well as you do earplugs they will make you custom moulds for in-ear monitors so that you can buy a set of any your monitors, like these ones, like the Shure 215s, mm-hmm. take the little foam the foam piece off that comes with them mm-hmm. and put on your custom made that's only, it's perfect for your ear, it's been custom made to fit you only, and put it onto the headphones so that you have a perfect seal. And the reason why you would do that is because when you put that in, it's designed specifically for use to block out every single noise round about you. I mean, these ones block out pretty well, but the custom molds block out even more, you know, to the point where you you almost can't hear anything, apart mm. from just the vibrations in your head. Um, <laughs> this this is a lot more Spooky. expensive. You can also get, like, I mean, the sky's the limit on these things, that, like big touring yeah. musicians like, I don't know, Prince or something, someone like that kind of caliber when he was alive, um, would use, like, quad driver headphones and stuff worth like two grand with custom moulds and everything and just ridiculous money Uh, you can get really really expensive ones I I don't really like I've got some friends who use like dual drivers like they've got two speakers in them like one for bass one for treble and all that and they're like oh yeah it's so Mm. much better but I'm like I don't know is this a wee bit snobbery I I, I just I like I like simplicity it seems unnecessary yeah I don't know, get yourself something, get yourself on the sort of bottom rung of any your monitoring mm. and just kind of work up from there. Find find yeah. ones that you're comfortable with and stick with them. Get used to them. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what I did. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I think I've mentioned before, to, because um, I'm a drummer, this may work for you actually as well. Um, when you play with any of your monitors, it's like you're in a mm-hmm. bubble. And putting them on for the first time and playing drums feels wimpy and horrible. The reason being is because you're not getting any bass. Because these ones don't have bass drivers in them, they're just, you know, they're just single single driver headphones. They just kind of cover, you know, a, a kind of rough frequency range. It's not the full spectrum. Yeah. I don't feel the bass drum like I used to. Because mm-hmm. I used to have a drum monitor with bass drum and it used to boom right at me. I don't get that anymore. So I bought a... I bought um, basically an ass vibrator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a, like it's called a it's called a throne thumper. So what it is is a it's a little bass driver, a little bass speaker, a subwoofer type thing that you strap yeah. to your drum stool. And what you do is you put a mic um, a microphone in your bass drum, and you route that microphone to your butt. And it vibrates your seat and it gives you the experience of feeling the monitor as if it's still next to you. But you can't hear it. You just feel it. And I swear it is... See, without it, I just can't do it. It's it's just horrible. It's like playing in a bubble. It's like I'm not... It's like I'm playing an electric kit. It's just... It's just lifeless. As soon as I turn the thing on, I'm like, oh, so good. Yeah. It tends to be... I usually tend to stand, stand like... Depends next on next how big the, the stage is, but I quite I stand in front of my bass amp, so I always feel the air pushing yep. past my. Well, uh, it's the equivalent of taking your cab away. Yeah, if you took your cab away, you'd be like, "Oh, I miss this." Yeah, if if you took the cab away, I would be like, "My bass sounds awful." Yeah, so I'd, I I don't I'm not I'm not feeling it. Yeah, you know, the first year I went out and gigged with those headphones, I did it without the throne thumper and. I just felt that something was missing. Something was horrible. And I'm, I'm looking online for solutions. And then I saw that. I was like, oh, it's £300. Do I really need to spend this? And I had noticed because I couldn't hear my bass drum, I was kicking the absolute life out of my bass drum to try and hear it. So every night I was hammering away all night for four hours straight with my right foot on the kick drum. And I'd wake up the next morning 
with a little limp for about half an hour until my leg came right. Every single time I went gigging, I was doing damage to my knee. When I got the mm. throne thumper, no more knee problems. Went away overnight. Mm. Uh, I was overplaying to try and hear myself. Yeah. Uh, now that I can hear myself properly, I've got monitoring in my ears and monitoring in my butt. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. Never look back. Um, yeah. So it just shows you like monitoring is like so important. Um, and it's a reason to join the MU as well if you fancy your custom molds. Um, yeah, apart if, from like other other benefits, yeah, like insurance and you know, uh, you know, legal like advice, liability. like yeah, like especially during COVID, like just gen generally what to do and as a musician and self employed help and yeah. stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, so basically the moral of the story is. I'm a big advocate for any of monitors. I do like stage monitors if they're done right, and they rarely, rarely are. If you're going around the scene in Glasgow and you know your local town or whatever, and you're just playing gigs randomly, and stage monitors mm. it can be a hit or a miss. It just depends on the engineer, depends on the venue, depends on how loud everything is. I would strongly suggest any of your monitors if you're thinking about them, look into them. It's not as complicated as you think. Um, it's it's just Literally, the only thing that changes is instead of delivering sound to speakers, you're delivering sound to a headphone amp, which then gets dished out to each individual member. Mm -hmm. um, it can be figured out. It's not, and it's not going to break your bank. Um, it'll break your mm -hmm. bank if you let it and you go crazy on the gear. But yeah, don't obsess over the gear. Um, go for the brands that you know are like tried and tested. For example, Behringer, like you're saying, mm -hmm. like. Some some brands that are like less quality, well, yeah, less quality, uh, but are still good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other one that comes to mind, um, Toman's house brand, T Harley Benton as well. Uh, uh, Harley Benton's just the guitars. Uh, the, oh, that's right. They're, yeah, it, yeah. are in ear monitors and microphones and stuff. It's all under the name T Bone, and okay. it's 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 good. Like people people. Uh, people use them, you know. It's just it, you, it, it, they just work, which is what you want, yep. and they're pretty cheap. Okay, Todd Howard, they're um, not gonna. It just works. Um, it just works. <laughs> um, so that's kind of that's kind of everything covered. Um, if anyone has any questions about how to get themselves set up in any of your monitors, feel free to send us a a wee message um, if you want to yeah. like maybe your situation's slightly different and you, you're not sure how to adapt to that you maybe you fancy that setup, but you're not quite sure how to approach it feel free to ask for advice because we are we are here to offer if you like it or not um, <laughs> um, so yeah that we should have done this episode ages ago to yeah be we should have done this much earlier um but that's hey -ho. that's yeah, hey ho. You can you can listen to it in any order you want, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, like always, if you're enjoying the podcast, please give us a wee like and <laughs> subscribe and rating and all that, and recommend to your pals wherever you can. Mm. Um, the ratings really help um, boost the algorithms in our favor. And watch on YouTube. We recommend you watch on on YouTube. Everything gets uploaded there. Um, the mm -hmm. su subscribing and liking videos is, is a big help um, if you can do that please do and we as I said earlier we're doing the different PDFs downloadable free PDFs on the website for various things we'll have gear lists and all sorts of things coming uh, which you can totally get for free just sign up mm -hmm. and we'll let you know when we update the lists uh, as we go through the year and mm. that's pretty much it i'm not quite sure what we're going to do next week um maybe julie has some bright ideas come up with something we always do yeah yeah i'd rather you could always come up with something i'm like so it's great <laughs> <laughs> no, feel free man feel free i'll try and come up with something cool so hope you're all having a good week and we will see you next time bye right bye